Saturday, September 14th. At this time each morning and each evening at 6.45 Eastern Daylight Time, Columbia calls in its correspondents for reports of the diplomatic, economic, and battle fronts. This morning, we are to hear from Edwin Hartridge in Berlin, Larry Lasser in London, and a report on the national situation by Albert Warner in Washington. Now, while we're waiting for the report of Mr. Hartridge over transatlantic shortwave radio, here's news from other points. A communique from Rome says that in North Africa, there is further intense activity by exploring parties on the desert and frontier between Libya and Egypt. In the last few days, there have been unconfirmed reports that Italy is preparing a major offensive against the British forces in Egypt. According to these unconfirmed reports, the Italians would stage a campaign aimed to capture the all-important Suez Canal. The Rome communique claims a convoy of steamers escorted in the eastern Mediterranean by warships was bombed. British land bases were also said to have been attacked. And Romania's new dictator, General Antonescu, decreed the supervision of commerce and industry in that country by state commissioners who must be of pure Romanian stock. Observers said he apparently was seeking to make good on his announced determination to run the country without interference from any political group. Somewhat of a problem since he took charge without organized backing. Now the news direct from Europe. First report of Edwin Hartridge from the German capital. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Berlin. German planes are again on the way to London this morning and other places in South England. But at this moment, we have no further details of what is actually happening. The big news here this morning is furnished by the CBS Bureau in London. The German press today is giving a big play to the CBS story of Thursday, in which it was reported that plans are now being made for the evacuation of the government from London. So the book should be about your headlines with a story like this. The flight of the plutocrats beginning. And the big set on Mittag also picks up the story, headlining it, quote, the plutocratic hi-hats follow their horses, end of quote. And the bait said informs its readers that all upper class English people are leaving for their country homes to avoid the German raids on London. The paper adds, they have sent their horses and their children to the United States and Canada, and many are making plans to follow them. However, the bait said states that the government is not leaving London for the present. And other papers carry the headline, plutocrats flying from the burning London, end of quote. And was added, quote, the working class stays behind to pay the bill, end of quote. In the same line, the Germans wrote a scornful of reports from London that the English had so strengthened their anti-aircraft defenses around the British capital, the German planes are finding it much harder to break through. A radio commentator remarked this morning that in any event, quote, the alleged improvements will pass a severe test during the course of the next few days. The statement made by the British Broadcasting Corporation looks very much like an item concocted for the purpose of cheering up the population of London, end of quote. And another paper in Berlin adds that if the London defenses have been strengthened, then the defenses in the other parts of the country have been weakened as a result. The bombing of Buckingham Palace is another big story here. The Berlin papers give all the details available that have been broadcast or published so far. However, German shortwave English news broadcast treats the story in a different manner. It continues to use the story put out last night that, quote, Several bombers of the DO-17 type bombed a large oil depot situated in the vicinity of Buckingham Palace yesterday afternoon, end of quote. And that is all. No mention is made that their bombs <coughs> actually hit the royal residence. And the green papers make no mention of the reported attack on the oil depot in the vicinity of Buckingham Palace. It apparently turned out to be an attack on the palace itself, as the reports in the foreign press stated. I've been listening to an interesting little propaganda playlet broadcast in English by the German shortwave radio. It is beamed for the British Isles. The radio play concerns the English upper classes and their alleged war ideas. The principal characters are Lady Violet Potluck and the Marchioness of Dudley. It seems that Lord Reginald Potluck is a little bit too patriotic for his wife and passes up all the opportunities to make money by getting into the armaments industry. However, at a tea party, Lady Violet sees her opportunity. There is a Mr. Miller, an American who's engaged in selling second-hand airplanes. And the markets of Dublin, whose line as the radio play progresses, have been mined from the Mr. Miller's stack and reselling them to the British government. Finally, Lady Violet asks her husband to do the same. He replies, that buying second-hand rickety planes is not patriotic. Lady Violet overcomes his objections. 
Let us observe an anti-aircraft. Press with them down, yes. That would happen anyhow. Then this radio playlet reaches the trench room. Will the dollar pay for it? The dollar will pay for it? Then you say money to the British government. Our money will be safe from the Roman tax collectors. But it will be back in the United States. Well, let me give you an idea of what the Germans think of the court and his plutocrats, unquote. We have the German plant with their patriotism in war efforts. This is Edwin Hackridge, a returning out of Columbia in New York. This is New York, and here's a dispatch from Sofia, Bulgaria. The Bulgarian Communist Party has issued another manifesto, the third in ten days, violently attacking Germany and Italy and demanding that Bulgaria sign a mutual assistance pact with Russia. The latest was labeled an appeal to the Bulgarian people, and it denounced the present government of Bulgaria. Now we hear the latest news from the British capital, reported by Larry Lasser. Go ahead, London. This is London. And there were time bombs near our office haven't gone off yet. London has had two more short raids since daylight this morning, but there's none on now. All last night at spaced out intervals, about ten minutes apart, German raiders swept over this city. It was a clear night with brilliant moonlight, silhouetting all of London's prominent buildings. But the weather helped both defenders and attackers alike. The guns of London raised a storm of shrapnel with a regularity timed by the raiders' visits. There were moments last night, between the periods of silence, when the air actually seemed to churn with the fury of London's defense guns. Possibly, as a result of this, most of last night's raiding was confined to the outskirts of the city. There were more German trains over London than on previous nights. But though they came over relays, they came over singly for the most part, an obvious tribute to the effectiveness of London's defense guns. Throughout the all-night raid, from about 9 o'clock until half past 5, the duel between the guns and the bombers was fought. And taking into account all the stories we have heard about the strength of the German Air Force, it would seem that if the number of planes which came over last night constitutes the main strength of the German night bombers, then the London guns are victorious. But I'm crossing my fingers as I say that. I watched the duel from a high route last night for a short time. And certainly most of the stuff coming down was British, clinking shrapnel from the anti-aircraft burst. At one time, a big German raider dropped what seemed to be bags of incendiary bombs. An entire square residential block leaped into flames. But in a few minutes, London's fire brigades were tearing down the streets in that direction. Then to the west, we saw what was apparently an oil bomb explode. These are large cylinders filled with crude oil and high explosives. When it hit, it enveloped a large building in yellow flame, topped by a great black smoke cloud. Just like a kerosene lamp explosion. Many of London's night workers are becoming volunteer firefighters on short notice. When the German attack was at a tight last night, fire bombs fell on the southwest London Square. Bus drivers and conductors left their vehicles and helped to put it out. And these are the busmen who nightly maintain their routes to the most heavily bombed London areas. And if you don't think that takes nerve, well, everyone in London thinks it does. We've had a number of incidents here of persons being trapped for days in the, by the debris of falling buildings. One girl was rescued this morning after being imprisoned in her wrecked home for four days and four nights. For several hours last night, observers on the English coast saw the German anti-aircraft guns in action and bomb flashes near Cape Greenays. Apparently, the RAF were bombing German gun positions again on the French coast. And we're told that last night, the RAF again bombed the, bombarded the French Channel ports. Bomb flashes could be seen intermittently from dusk until dawn. The English coast itself felt the clump of the bombs across the channel. It seemed to be the most prolonged bombardment of the invasion force thus far. The official communique regarding last night's raids tells us this morning, and I quote, that the enemy air attacks were mainly concentrated on the London area and on a town in South Wales. Although many bombs were dropped all over the British capital, the eastern, southern, and southwestern districts caught the brunt of the raid. Many fires were started. All are now under control. Details of the casualties in South Wales are not yet available, unquote. Neither are last night's London casualties. Incidentally, one of Buckingham Palace's time bombs has just exploded. It was in the roadway outside the palace. It tore off a big stone pillar and part of the metal railing in front of the famous building. 
In daylight rage yesterday on London, the German planes seemed to be trying to make news by bombing Buckingham Palace and other prominent London buildings. It was a kind of propaganda air raid. And to me, it clearly demonstrated how total war has become a compound of the military and the psychological. We return you now to CBS in New York. That was Larry LeSueur reported from London. Now we hear the latest news from our own national capital, reported by Albert Warner. We take you now to Washington. From a well-informed official source with access to private information from Europe comes this piece of information. Germany now has, within the strategic occupied portion of France, three million men. According to this report, right across the narrow channel from England is a tremendous force of waiting soldiers and German labor battalions. The latter are building new airports in France. They are trying to expand the transportation system. And in Norway, according to a report from the same source, there are now 300,000 Germans. Perhaps it was these German concentrations which led British Prime Minister Churchill to warn his people that attempted hostile invasion was imminent. There along the Channel in the North Sea, there along the coast of Norway, these potential invaders wait while German airplanes try to destroy British production and communication and morale, wait while German planes try to take command of the air. Democratic Senator Chandler of Kentucky expresses approval of William Allen White's proposal to give Britain 50 flying fortresses and 22 torpedo boats. It was Mr. White's committee which sponsored the transfer of destroyers. However, the Kentucky senator suggested that in exchange the United States ought to receive the direct ownership of the bases which it acquired in the destroyer trade. Chairman Sal Bloom of the House Foreign Affairs Committee said he thought we were better off with a lease. Any businessman, he said, would rather have a long-term lease than direct ownership of real estate, and that applies to Caribbean islands. Mr. Bloom said that any such proposal as that made by Mr. White would have to be investigated and judged by the Army and Navy and the Attorney General. But many Army officers possessing relatively few of the latest fighting planes are already crying out against a transfer of flying fortresses. Now it seems that today may come the final legislative action on the conscription bill. Apparently, the bill was all set for dispatch to the, to the White House yesterday. Then came a last-minute flurry in the Senate and another day of delay. To be sure, it was also Friday the 13th yesterday, and there are superstitious backers of conscription who were not displeased at the postponement. Again, the Senate will consider the draft bill in slightly altered form today. The conferees between Senate and House will send the measure back with the one change which a majority of the Senate demanded last night. That one change involves the provision for conscription of industry. The House formula for taking over recalcitrant factories is restored. The Senate voted to instruct its conferees to accept the House provision. That's been done. Now swift action in the Senate is expected and then approval by the House. As the bill seems likely to be passed, therefore, businessmen who refuse to cooperate in the defense program will be faced with a heavy club behind the door for the government to use. Manufacturers who refuse to accept defense orders or decline to give them priority face the seizure and operation of their plants by the government. In addition, a recalcitrant manufacturer may be imprisoned. In a sense, this House provision is milder than the original Senate provision, which allowed the government to take permanent title to non-cooperative facilities of any kind. But the conference committee, in its own version, had stricken out the jail penalties and otherwise whittled down the club behind the door. Now the club is there again, a hefty bludgeon. We return you now to New York. And with these reports from Washington, Columbia concludes this regular morning report of national and international developments. Edwin Hartridge reported from Berlin, Larry Lesser reported from London, and Albert Warner from Washington. Larry Elliott speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>